So this is an extra special video because this is actually the first 3D printer review on this channel that I didn't have to pay for. This is the brand new Creality Ender 3 V3 SE. How's that for a mouthful? Claim to fame is that it's Creality's newest version of their popular Ender series of 3D printers. It's a budget-friendly printer that touts printing speeds of 250 millimeters per second at 2500 millimeters per second squared of acceleration. It includes both a CR touch as well as a strain gauge for automatic bed leveling and automatic Z offset. It has a sprite style direct drive extruder, dual Z axis lead screws, and dual 8mm Y axis linear shafts that replace the POM wheels. It has a more refined slim body design that eliminates the stick out from the X and Y axis motors and belt tensioners, and has more low profile Z axis carriage plates to give it a clean modern look. If we look at the specifications, we can see that the build volume is 220 by 220 by 250 with a typical printing speed of 180 millimeters per second, a maximum printing speed of 250 millimeters per second with an acceleration of 2,500 millimeters per second squared. Again, we can see that it includes a Sprite direct drive extruder. It has auto bed leveling via the CR touch and it has automatic Z offset via the strain gauge on the bed. It includes a PC spring steel build surface, which I'm not really used to. I'm used to the PEI sheets and G10 Garolites, but we'll see how this turns out. It uses the now bog standard 32-bit silent board with a 3.2-inch display screen with a knob for menu selection. It includes power loss recovery. File transfers are handled via full-size SD card. And down here it says that the slicing software is Creality Print, Cura 5.0, or Simplify 3D, you can really use any software, but it seems like these ones are the ones that have profiles available for them as of right now. If we scroll up a little bit, we could see that some of the optional accessories include a PEI build surface, a filament runout sensor, and some plated copper alloy nozzles. Looking at the shape and size of them, you can tell that they're using the longer spider style nozzles, but it doesn't include the filament runout sensor. You have to buy that separately. So let's unbox this thing, set it up, and give it a good once over. Inside the box, there's the instruction manual, some stickers, a warranty card, and a tool to unclog your nozzle if it gets jammed. A pack of sample filament, the full-size SD card with the USB reader, and the bags of assembly screws. The display with control knob and mounting bracket already attached. An IEC power cable for your region, and the tried and true Creality spool holder. Unfortunately, it doesn't have a roller bearing. Next we have the gantry and tool head that comes pre-assembled. There is a belt on top that ties the two Z-axis lead screws together. It's only a single motor. And then under that, we have the complete base of the machine. So at first glance, the PC spring steel sheet does kind of resemble a surface from a Creality K1 or even a Solval SV07, which makes sense because Creality builds the majority of Solval's machines, if not all of them. This sheet even has the alignment notches in the back that I liked about the SV07 Plus. It's a single-sided build plate, so if you damage it, you'll have to replace it right away. But there are PEI sheets available on Slamazon for around 12 to 18 bucks. As mentioned before, the Z-axis is a dual lead screw with a single motor that uses a timing belt system to drive both screws at the same time. The screws are also supported on both the top and the bottom of the gantry. They provide you with little baggies of screws that you'll need to assemble the machine most of which are individually wrapped and labeled on the outside of the bag. There's also a little ribbon cable bracket that you'll need to install after assembly. Assembly is pretty simple. Slide the pre-assembled gantry into the T-shaped openings on the base, attach the short M3 cap screws into the holes on the right side rail, and snug them down. Then lay the machine over and attach the six M3 cap head screws from underneath. The one little annoyance I found was there was no way to get the short side of the Allen key into the recesses where the screws go, making it tricky to tighten them fully. I got around this with a driver set I got from Slamazon, but a T-handle Allen wrench would have been nice to have as well.
Once you're finished with that, attach the wiring to the Z and the E axis motors, connect the ribbon cable, attach the control screen to the right side with the M4 button head screws, and attach the cable. Slide the ribbon into the little bracket they provide on the back of the gantry. And always make sure to check the voltage switch to make sure it's set to the proper voltage for your region. Attach the spool holder with the remaining M5 button head screws, and we're just about ready to power up and start printing. Oh yeah, and don't forget that cable bracket. I took the cover off of the hot end to see what was going on under there. You can see what looks to be a 25mm cooling fan mounted directly to the heatsink and the CR touch over to the left. Everything plugs into a daughter board that connects to the ribbon cable. This machine has a longer heat block for more efficient melting of plastic coming through the nozzle. You can see the build quality is very good and the extruder is the Creality Sprite SE that you can buy separately from the UPI store. Ask me how I know. Once you power up your machine, the first thing you have to do is select the language that you want the interface to be in. And now we can see the interface. It only has a couple of different menus that you can go to. The print screen will show you all of the files that are on your SD card. The prepare screen lets you move the machine around, disable your steppers, select auto home, change your Z offset, and set some extruder options. The control page will let you set your temperatures for your nozzle and your bed, enable your fans and so on. You can change the maximum speeds and acceleration under the motion setting. You can also change your steps per millimeter for each of the axes when you do your fine tuning. You can store your config, you can read your config, you can edit the leveling data so you could actually edit the leveling points that get measured when you actually run the bed level. You can go into there and you can change those. And then under leveling, it goes into the auto Z offset and bed level procedure. And we could see that right here. So as luck would have it, last week I was contacted by another Slamma scammer asking me to try out this Beagle Cam. And I figured out oh, what the hell. So I plugged it in and the thing automatically came right up. I have it set up for an Elegoo Neptune 2, but they both use Marlin systems. So yeah, six to one half dozen the other. It, it actually connected and everything seems to work. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to run a print through this and I'll, hell, I'll grab a time lapse. This will be the first real time lapse that I could actually record. So this will be pretty fun. Before I do that, however, I have to slice a file. So I'm going to use the Creality Print software to slice the file because it's the only slicer that I have that has the Ender 3 V3 SE profile built into it. The Creality Print software is actually Creality's own product, but it's kind of a copy and paste of Cura and Prusa Slicer. If you look at the change logs and all of the information on their GitHub page for the Creality Print software, you can see where they give credit to Cura and to Prusa Slicer for some of the features that they're building into this software. The software is actually meant for not only 3D printers, but also laser cutters and CNC machines, which I'm quite interested in seeing how that actually works. But here I'm slicing just a standard calibration cube, just so I can test out the machine and make sure it's all working. The Beagle Cam does not have any kind of Wi-Fi file transfer from the slicer, and it's the same on Prusa Slicer as well. So I'll just save it to my desktop, and then I have to go into the Beagle Cam web UI and upload it from there. As far as the settings are concerned for the slicer, 
everything's handled by the right hand side you've got your machine set up and then underneath where you've got all of your different layer height profiles if you double click on those you'll get a user interface where you can make adjustments to all of your settings from there i ran a couple of calibration cubes using the filament that was provided from Creality, but it's white, so it's really hard to see what is actually going on as far as artifacts and stuff are concerned. So I use the Kinluat Red PLA that I have because that does tend to show a lot of artifacts and ringing and things like that. So I did a couple of cubes with that as well. And then after those were done, I also printed a Voron test cube. So one thing I was able to do in Prusa Slicer was actually copy the settings from Reality Print over to Prusa Slicer. It took a little bit of doing. You have to transfer the stuff manually, but if you look here, 41 minutes and 50 second estimated cycle time. Same down here, 42 minutes, pretty much on the money. So I'm going to print one of these out with the Prusa settings, and I want to see if the quality is any different. And I really hate to brag, but that time was right on the money. And here, I've got some footage of the actual cube being printed. And you can see that the machine moves around pretty quickly with the profile settings I transferred from Creality Print. The machine isn't very loud while it's running either. Like most machines of this style, most of the noise comes from the cooling fans rather than the actual movement of the printer itself. And as you can see here, white is a little tricky to check for printing issues, so it does look pretty good. Here's the same cube made out of the Kinlawat Red PLA, and as you can see, there are some minor print issues like ringing and corner bulging from overextrusion. But generally speaking, it doesn't look too bad for a first print off of a brand new printer that I'm not quite familiar with yet. The bottom of the prints also wind up with this white color on them. I'm guessing it has something to do with the polycarbonate sheet. You can see the results of both of the Voron cubes here. There isn't much of a difference between them from a slicer standpoint, but again, you can see some ringing and corner bulges from overextrusion, which is pretty typical of a Marlin system that isn't using linear advance. There's the dreaded white surface underneath, but overall, they're not too bad. Sizes look pretty good. I'm sure there's some dialing in that I can do, but I do plan on testing this printer out in a couple of different ways, so I'll figure out some ways to optimize it. So I've actually been using this printer for a few days, and my takeaways are that it is a very good, budget-friendly printer that's easy to assemble. The Auto-Z offset is a nice feature, but it still requires a little bit of adjusting to get to the sweet spot, so it's not completely perfect. For an out-of-the-box solution to set Z offset, it is very good. But I think one of the reasons it requires a little adjusting after the fact is because the polycarbonate sheet sticks a little too well for my liking, making prints incredibly hard to remove at times. I've got a PEI sheet on order because I just prefer that build surface a little more. It uses a Marlin-based system, so it can be used remotely with Octoprint, Repetier, Pronterface, and as we saw in the video, the Beagle Cam. Being that it's a Marlin system, the out-of-box prints are good, but there are corner deviations that will require a little bit of tuning if you're printing parts with a lot of sharp corners at high speeds, or if you're printing parts that require better size accuracy than your standard Dongasaurus or one of those freaking boats. I could also probably blame my workbench for the ringing, so I can't completely fault the machine for that. I do plan on diving a little deeper into tuning and modding this machine in upcoming videos, so stay tuned for those. Ultimately, for the price tag, it's a great entry-level printer that has more of a home appliance look than an industrial machine, so if you're out for a clean aesthetic, this is the machine for you. The custom extrusions and plastic base they use aren't conducive for modification parts, but I think they were going for more of a plug-and-play solution with this one, and I think they hit the mark pretty good. It's a great printer to start with and grow into. I would also like to just take a moment and thank Upi for supplying me with this 3D printer for my unbiased review. Click my affiliate link down below to check out their Amazon store and grab yourself an Ender 3 V3SE. And as of right now, if you use the coupon code in the video description, you can get 10% off of the Creality Ender 3 V3SE as part of a special promotion for the release of this video. So that'll about wrap it up for this one. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't done so yet, please subscribe to the channel. And if you know somebody who would be interested in this type of stuff, share it with a friend because sharing is caring. Check out my affiliate links down in the description below at no additional cost to you. It just puts a little bit of catnip in my kitty and it helps me with my future channel endeavors. And if you're on that cesspool that is Facebook, join the group, Elegu Neptune Series 3D Printers, Mods, Tweaks, and Improvements, where we offer 24-hour live chats and community support and overly abuse the everyone tag. 
But hey, at least we're not a spam fest of 3D artists like that Neptune 4 page. If you feel like killing 30 seconds of your time, check out my website, www.theferalengineer.com. It's just a whole bunch more of the same stuff, but it justifies the 12 bucks a year I spend on the URL. And once again, thank you to all of my catnip contributors, both past, present, and future. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you again soon.